Uh, hello everybody and welcome to my introductory C sharp red team uh, course. It's going to be mostly focused on little primers for payload development and uh, evasion. Uh, yeah, so who am I? My name is Dylan, but I've also gone by the alias Awesome DT or uh, Night Gerald, and I'm an aspiring red teamer. Currently, I'm focusing on learning more Active Directory abuses and bettering my payload development. I also got some expensive four-letter JPEGs uh, recently. So the purpose of this course, it's going to be more of a note dump than a course. I'm going to be trying to explain to some depth all of the techniques and projects I've run into since focusing on evasion and payload development. And the reason for this is when I was trying to learn this stuff, I mean, information existed, but for one reason or another, I had a lot of struggle trying to grasp this stuff and it took me a lot of time. So I want to centralize access to this information and sort of ease the introduction to this whole learning process. Uh, keep in mind, though, this course is going to focus on C sharp syntax and ways to access the Windows API and syscalls in different ways, and also in x64 architecture uh, only. It won't focus on implementing them in things like uh, shellcode loaders or inline portable executable or whatever. Uh, but after this course, you should be able to implement the, the Win API and syscalls into your projects based on the knowledge of the techniques or their existing implementations in other languages. Some disclaimers. Uh, one, uh, I don't have any professional red team experience or anything of the like. Everything presented here is from my uh, from blog post readings and my own experimentation. So with that, there might be some inaccurate statements or partial truths made throughout this course. So feel free to contact me to fix something inaccurate that I've might have made within this course. I'm hoping to learn just as you guys are. And lastly, I don't consent or advocate for the usage of the material taught here for malicious purposes. Everything that I've done and made from this course has either been used on my own VMs or uh, another consenting party, and that should remain the same for anybody else uh, using or creating things based off of this uh, course. So uh, why C sharp? When it comes to some powerful languages like C and C++, there's a lot of fundamentals that you need to understand to effectively and safely utilize them. And in my opinion, the syntax is it takes a bit to get used to, especially uh, when you are like me and having a very, very little coding background uh, to start off with. Also, it turns out C Sharp is kind of capable and has some pretty cool properties. So that's another thing it has going for it. But yeah, to sum it up, uh, skill issue. So uh, some the tools I will be using a uh, first a Windows 10 VM to develop test and run our executables because I would never run stuff on my host machine, uh, never that. Uh, for debugging and looking at memory and stuff like that, we'll be using x64 debug, uh, Win debug, and Process Hacker. As for our actual IDE, we'll be using Visual Studio 2022 with uh, .NET Framework. 4.5 or above uh, that's what we'll be compiling our c-sharp stuff in and i personally use .NET framework over .NET, even though uh, .NET is going to be like the thing moving forward and because .NET executables are kind of fat .NET framework stuff is smaller and it, it's just a personal preference honestly but the techniques you learn from here should be able to be ported to .NET relatively smoothly or, or with minor adjustment. As for uh, crediting everything from this course, uh, this isn't an, an exhaustive list, but it, for the most part, this is the these are these are the people who published some really amazing material and helped me out along the way these past uh, several months. So yeah. Uh, Thank you to all these people and uh, all the contributions to the or my knowledge and that stuff. Yeah. So for variables, to actually create a variable, we just do the type of the variable. So in this case, an integer, uh, the name of the variable in the middle, an equal sign, and then the value on the right. In this case, in x equals 2. If we want to update the variable's value, we just get the variable name and reassign it a different value. 
we don't need to uh, redeclare the type because we, we already defined it as an uh, x as an int, so it will always be an int. If we're if we don't know what value to give it, we could just use the default keyword, which will give it like the default value for that data type. And for integers, I believe that's going to give in this case y the value of zero. And if we don't know what type a variable is going to be, we could just use var, uh, and it'll sort of automatically determine the type of uh, the variable based on the value that's going to be passed to it. So in this case, five is an int, so var is going to determine that test is an int. Uh, for more complex data types though, it might be a little more vague. And since C sharp is strongly typed when it comes to reassigning values to variables from a variable of a different type, so in this case I have a long, and I'm trying to assign x that value of the long. If I just try to do it like this, uh, Visual Studio is going to start crying at me. But what I could try to do is a typecast, which is going to sort of try to convert the data type while maintaining the same value. So I can try to cast uh, z into an integer, and then I can reassign x that, uh, that value because x is an integer. Uh, this isn't always the safest thing to do, but it's uh, pretty convenient. Now there's a lot of data types. There's bytes, shorts, ints, longs, and their unsigned equivalent, which means not negative. Uh, these are going to be more important because they each have different sizes uh, in memory. And that's going to be important for when uh, we start dealing with uh, more uh, 132 API stuff. There's also arrays, which are multiple pieces of data that, uh, of the same type, and they're held together. Uh, so in this case, I have an integer array. Uh, the way we can define this is we do the data type of the array, and then we do two brackets, which uh, tells us that it's going to be an array. The variable name equals, and then we have to create a new array. So we're going to use a new keyword because arrays are a bit of a complex data type. That's why we have to use the new keyword. And then we do a new integer array, and then we do curly brackets and put all the uh, elements of the array in there. Uh, we can actually specify the size of the array or we can just leave it blank and then it'll sort of just figure out the size on its own. Uh, once we create an array that we cannot add or remove elements from the array, uh, we can change the values of the elements in there though. If you want to access the values of the array, we can just type out the variable or the name of the array. So in this case, in uh, R and then just do uh, brackets and then the index. Uh, zero is the first index, one is the second index. So in this case, this is reassigning X the value of the first uh, element of the array, which in this case is one. If I want to change uh, the value of the first member of the array, we, I could just do this. So this is going to get the first item of in R and then it's going to change it to three. Last thing we have to cover are structs, which are sort of like our own custom defined data types, and they have uh, they can have multiple members. So in this case, I have my struct, and it has an integer named member one and a long name member two. So to uh, create a instance of this, we can do my struct. Uh, so we have to get the name of the data type. In this case, it's our it's a uh, my struct and then I'm making a variable called <laughs> my struct and I'm going to say default to give it uh, it all it, this is going to populate its members with the default value. So in this case, member one is going to be zero, member two is going to be zero. Another way that we can uh, instantiate this struct is we could do my struct two equals new my struct. Uh, I don't know if there's any sort of benefits to do it one way or another. I just use default because it's a little easier to read. But you can see because my struct is a bit more of a complex data type than just like an in or a long, uh, the way we create an instance of it is similar to an array with the new keyword. Now, because I made the structs members public, we can access or basically read and write from the values of the members. So you can see here I'm doing my struct member one equals two. So I'm going it's going to get this instance of the struct and it's going to change its member one property to the value uh, two. If I want to read from it, I could just do like x equals my struct dot member one. You can see that Visual Studio was 
auto completing it for me, which is pretty nice. And yeah. So Boolean conditions, that's like stuff that's true or false. There's gonna be your if, else if, else switch statements. We can write an uh, if statement like this, you just do if and then parentheses, you specify the condition. In this case, the double equals is checking if the value on the left is equal to the value on the right. So it's checking if x is one. And if that's not, uh, if that condition doesn't line up, it's going to do this else if. And if all, everything fails, it's going to go to the else. We could stuff more else ifs in here if we wanted to. In this case, this should be the one being printed because x is declared as one and therefore x equals one. So if we run this, it's going to say x is one. We can make these a little more complex by adding the double and, which means, or the ampersands, which mean and. So in this case, for this condition to happen, or for this code to execute, uh, x has to be one and y has to be three. And in this case, y is two, so this should not be executing. And the other condition is, uh, if x is 1 or y is 3. So if either is true, then this is going to execute. And because x is 1, uh, this should be the one executing. So if I continue execution, you can see it says x is 1 or y is 3. Ne <coughs> Next up, we have uh, switch statements. So for switch statements, you write out switch and then you specify like a variable. And then it's going to check, make a series of comparisons to that variable. So it's going to check in the case that x is 1, do this. In the case that x is 2, do this. And then this is sort of like your else statement or your default case, so your catch-all. After each case has to be a break. Uh, so then it's going to sort of exit out of the switch statement. So then if I hit enter, it's going to say x is 1 because x is 1. And then next up, we have the while loop. So the while loop is basically going to continuously execute code as long as a condition is uh, being met. So in this case, the condition is as long as uh, the variable z, which in this case is 3, is greater than 0, it's going to write out uh, z is, and then it's going to show the value of z. And then this, it's going to do a little decrement over here. So this should be printing around like three times or so. So we hit enter, it says three, and then two, and then one. And then once it's at prints one, z decrements to zero, but since zero isn't greater than zero, it's going to end the uh, loop. And then lastly, we have the for loop. So for the for loop, you write out uh, sort of like uh, a condition again. In this case, uh, we're saying we're gonna declare an integer i, uh, and that's gonna equal zero. And as long as i is less than 10, uh, the loop is going to maintain execution. And at the end, we, we uh, do a little operator on the variable that we declare inside this little for loop header. In this case, this is an increment operator. So i is going to continuously increase. And then it's just going to print i. And then a little thing that I added is, let's just say you have some alternative condition that you want to put in your loops. So in this case, uh, my my condition is that as long as i is less than 10, the loop is going to continue. But in this case, I want another condition. If i is 2, then I can uh, end the loop early. So that's what this is going to be here for. So it should print 0, 1, 2. And then, uh, yeah, there we go. So functions are sort of like blocks of code that we can call upon repeatedly uh, by just using the function and they can take arguments which the function can utilize so you can see that in this case i've declared a function first func uh, i've declared it as static and void as the return type which means it's not going to return anything and it's going to take an integer and label it as uh, arg1 and what it does is it's just going to print this and then it's going to uh, modify that integer uh, so if we actually call this, so if I run the executable, you can see that it's going to call first func, which says it's going, it has received the number five because the arg one I passed in is five. And note that even though I changed it to two in the function afterwards, uh, we can still see that arg one is still five because 
when we modify variables within the function, the scope of the modification is limited to the function unless we are passing something by reference, which is done for some complex data types like uh, instances of a class. Now for classes, they're, they're somewhat like structs, but they're more complex. They can have their own functions that are static, which means we can just call upon them. So in this case, like this static class method or non-static, which means you can only call upon them when you have an instance of the class. Uh, so in this case, this is going to be our uh, instance method. Then likewise, the variables, uh, by default, if you don't say anything, the uh, variables are going to be only applied to the instances of the class, or we can use a static variable to make, or the static keyword to make the variable static, which means that they're going to be accessible by the class directly. Uh, and there's going to be like one copy because I mean, there's only one my class, whereas instance variables uh, apply to each instance. So one instance can have a instance variable with a different value than another instance that has the same uh, instance variable name. And if we want to obtain an instance of our class, we're going to need to declare a constructor, which the format for that is you say public, and then you have the, uh, it's like declaring a function, but the name of this function is going to share the name as a class. And you don't need to specify any arguments that it takes in or any sort of operations. It'll, it'll just return an instance of the class. But in our case, uh, we're going to be specifying that the constructor takes in two variables uh, or two integers, x and y. And it's going to assign the instance variables x and y to those uh, respective values. I should probably fix this. It should be x instead of y. So if I continue execution, it's going. I'm going to instantiate the class, passing in one and two, and then I'm going to call a uh, class method. Now, because I kind of screwed it up, it's going to say that both uh, x and y are going to be the same value. So just do that. So it says my x is two and my y is two. Uh, because the constructor got the value of y or the second variable, which in this case was two, and then it applied it to, or it assigned the instance variable x and y uh, those values. And then class method simply prints those instance uh, variables. Now for the static method, uh, note that the calling the way it's called looks a little different. Rather than getting the instance of the class and then doing instance dot instance method, you just call upon it uh, directly. So you do class dot static method. And then if I do that, static method is simply going to print the static variable z, which should be five. Uh, note that in the static method, uh, I cannot access the instance variables x or y. So if I try to do const console can't type dot right line z and then I say x is uh, x Visual Studio is auto completing on me so if I do that it's going to error out because this is a static method uh, which isn't and st since static methods aren't called upon by the instances of the class uh, they can't access the instance variable, so it's going to uh, start crying. 
So manage code or manage memory is the C-sharp stuff that we're going to be, uh, that we write that is managed by the .NET runtime in the garbage compiler when the process is running. Whereas unmanaged memory is all the stuff that we do that sort of isn't handled by that. So as an example, in C or C++, you, you have to manually allocate and free your own memory. So that's considered uh, unmanaged. There's nothing managing it for you. Most of what we write in C-sharp is going to be manage. So take this byte array. I didn't have to manually allocate memory for it. I'm not going to have to like free memory f uh, when I'm done using it. Uh, garbage compiler will figure it out for me, essentially. But the Windows API works within the unmanaged side of things. So I, I can't really just pass this byte array into uh, Windows API if I'm trying to call it. So we're going to have to operate between these two uh, manage and unmanage realms. And the system runtime interop services uh, namespace is going to have a lot of tools to help us out with that. So as an example, I'm going to allocate this byte array into unmanaged memory. So theoretically, if I was calling the Windows API, I would be able to pass this uh, byte array in. So I'm going to call the Marshall allocate global function, which is from the interop services namespace. And I'm going to specify buff.length. So what this is going to do is it's going to allocate memory equivalent to the size of this byte array, which in this case is four because it's there's four bytes in here. And it's going to return a pointer to the, where it's allocating this uh, memory to. So I'm going to store that in the variable pbuff. From here, I'm going to copy this whole byte array into that allocated space. So I'm going to call marshall.copy. Buff is going to be the manage byte array that I'm copying. Zero is going to be the index of the byte array that's going to start at pbuff is the location of where I uh, allocate the memory to, and buff.length is uh, how many bytes I'm going to be writing in. So because I'm starting at the beginning of the array and I'm copying the length of the array, or in this case, four, it's going to copy the entirety of the array into the memory that I allocated. And from there, it's just going to print where it uh, wrote the memory to. So if I run this, it's going to say the memory was written to this address, popping open process hacker, and viewing the executables memory. If I paste this address in, I can see there's four letter A's because those four letter A's were my uh, byte array that I wrote into this uh, unmanaged memory. So P invoke or platform invoke is the capability of .NET that allows us to call unmanaged functions from our managed code. So as an example, this message box A function, which comes from user32.dll, according to Microsoft documentation, we can essentially import it into our code. There's a website called pinvoke.net, which helps us uh, do all that stuff. Although sometimes you're not one for one accurate, so you'll need to do a bit of tinkering, but you know, that's a part of the process. So in this case, uh, we're listing this attribute uh, that this external function that we're gonna use, message box A, is gonna come from user32.dll. And as for the data types, this is, uh, where it gets a little important when it comes to size and stuff. But basically, these are the C or C++ data types that it takes. It takes a handle to a window, LPC strings, and uh, a UN. So we have to get the equivalent data types in C Sharp, and then pinvoke is going to deal with all the magic that comes in sort of like uh, operating between the two. So the handle to the window, we can replace with an int pointer. Uh, LPC string is used with a string substitute with a string and then the uin we're just going to do a uin and then to call it i'm just going to do message box a and then pass in my manage data types uh, this flag i'm passing over here is just according to the documentation for the function it's just going to do a message box that will have one button that says okay so now if i run this you can see my little message box shows up now for more complex uh, APIs, let's take um, a low level one, that anti-query information process, for example. So this one queries information from a process and it returns this information in the form of unmanaged uh, data structures. The, in this case, when I'm calling it, I'm gonna be uh, requesting for process basic information. So it's gonna return to me uh, a pointer to uh, some process basic information structure. So the process basic information structure, pinvoke has it listed uh, defined, although in Boo language instead of 
uh, C sharp, but we can just sort of translate that over. But we're going to essentially uh, translate the process basic information just like we did with the uh, message box A function. We're going to convert its data types to the equivalent in C sharp. And we're going to also have this flag here that says that it's going to be like um, every member of the structure is going to be one after the other. So the first member is in memory will be the reserved one. The second member will be the PB uh, process environment block base address and then so on and so forth. So now defining the function, it's you know a similar process. Uh, we'll look at the p invoke documentation, copy and paste it over, make some slight modifications if we have to. And then as for calling it though, so the first argument it's gonna take is going to be a uh, handle to a process. Since I'm gonna query my my own processes information, I could just do a type cast of in pointer negative one and it's just going to read that and uh, know that I'm querying my own process. Next up, it's gonna take a, f a flag, which is literally just a uint, but with a fancy little name attached. And I'm going to be querying for process basic information. Uh, this is just out of my choice. You can do whatever you want. The third argument it's gonna take is a pointer to the process information. Now, if we actually look at the Microsoft documentation, this is something that's going to output. So we need to have some memory that's allocated so then it can output um, into that uh, address. And from there, we can read the outputted memory from this function to get an idea of uh, the data structure. Then the fourth argument it's gonna take is the length of the process information is gonna be querying. So in this case, since we're querying for process basic information, we're going to want it to query the size. Uh, we, want, we want the output size to be the size of the process basic information structure. So we could just uh, pass in Marshall size of and then the type of the process basic information. And because it's a uint and this returns an int, we're going to have to do a little bit of a typecast. And then it's going to, uh, according to the documentation, it's going to output a pointer to a u long that is the return length. So we're going to have to define an int pointer beforehand so then it can essentially write to that variable. Then once that function call is made uh, and the memory is output to the p info which we allocated right here, we're going to need to uh, marshal that unmanaged uh, process basic information structure to our managed one so we can access its members. And we could do this by calling the marshal pointer to structure function. We could specify the pointer uh, or the location of that structure. And so in this case, since it's outputting the P info, we're going to pass in P info. And then we're going to try to marshal that to a process basic information struct, which we defined above. And then this returns an object. So we're going to have to typecast it to a process basic information. And then we're just going to assign that to our variable. And then to see if it actually worked, we're going to print out uh, one of the members and see if it's accurate. So continuing our execution, we can see that uh, calling this uh, empty query information process, we got a return value of zero, which is good. If it's a zero, that means the API call went through. And according to uh, our code, the PB base address is at this 7BD85 thing. So if we look at process hacker, we can see our uh, PB address of this process because we created ourselves is 7BD85, so on and so forth. So we uh, our anti query information process call was successful. Now there are some drawbacks to using PNFO, uh, at least for our offensive use case. And the primary one being is uh, the IAT or the import address table of uh, our process is going to show that we're importing these APIs during runtime. So if we're using a combination of suspicious APIs like virtual alloc, write process memory, and create thread, then it's an easy way for defenders or uh, uh, defender software like uh, antiviruses and EDRs to uh, catch us. To address the IAT detection and some other ones, there's this 200 IQ guy by the alias The Wover, and he came up with dnfolk. It's the, it has multiple functionality, but the first one we're going to focus on is its ability to dynamically execute APIs rather than have 
allowing us to import them like in pinvoke and then which leaves a potential detection so the way it does this is through the dynamic api invoke uh, function if we look into this function it calls another function called let get library address get library address is going to try to see if the dll of the api that we're trying to dynamically execute. It's going to try to see if it's loaded in the current process. And if it isn't, it's going to load it from disk using the LDR load DLL API. And then from there, it's going to call the get exports, get export address function, which is going to traverse the PE, uh, in this case, the DLL in memory to see if, uh, to look for the function. Because there's an export table in the uh, in all uh, in DLLs if they export functions. And by looking at that, we can find the API that we want to dynamically execute. So after doing that, we'll have the address of the API we're trying to execute. But the way we actually go about executing it is through this really cool feature of C Sharp called delegates. So by using these delegates, we can essentially execute that uh, location of memory, which is in this case, an actual function. If we were trying to execute, you uh, use a delegate to execute a point in memory that isn't a function, it's probably gonna break something. So rather than doing our whole static extern function definitions, we can just declare a delegate. And if you notice, it looks very similar to a function definition. And in fact, these are, I believe, uh, identical t uh, argument types that we have from our p invoke definitions. The only difference is uh, we have to mark this little attribute up here. And instead of saying DLL import, we're gonna be saying that this delegate's gonna be used to execute a function pointer. Then to actually do the dynamic execution, we call the dynamic API invoke. Since we wanna execute message box A, we're gonna tell it to look or load user32.dll within user32.dll, we're going to try to find message and execute message box A. The delegate that we'll be using to execute message box A is the delegate which I defined as message box A up here. And the arguments is, are, is gonna be a object array passed by reference. Now, whereas we know in p invoke, we just kind of tossed all our arguments like we would with normal functions um, to do to make a delegate execute a function pointer, uh, it takes in the arguments via a, an object array. So over here, I'm just declaring an object array. And if you notice it, the arguments are the same ones that we used for the p invoke message box call. Now it's being passed by reference because sometimes uh, some APIs will modify the uh, arguments that you pass in. So just in case that happens, that's why we're passing these by reference and we will be able to uh, extract the altered values if that uh, scenario happens. So if I just execute this, ex uh, if I run this, you can see the message box comes out just fine. For the more complicated API, I'll be using query information process again. And just like before, allocate some memory so then it can output some pro the process basic information, set my object uh, array, which is the arguments I'm gonna pass in, then make the call of NT query information process from NT DLL, passing in the delegate oops, for NT query information process that I created up above, which is the same one that I've had from the pinvoke definition, passing in that object array over here and because I want to capture the NT status code in case there's an error, I'll just cast the output of dynamic API invoke into a uint. Dynamic API invoke returns an object because since it's supposed to be like a generic way to dynamically execute APIs, it's going to just return a generic object type that we can just then cast to the actual return type. And from here, I'm going to, just like before, uh, marshal the uh, outputted process basic information into a, the bandage structure. So then I can read from it. Uh, in this case, I'm just accessing the second or the third op, um, item within the array because that's where the address is. That, that's like, that was our argument that we passed in. So then if I continue execution, you can see NT status was zero. The 
PB base address is whatever that is. And if I look at the actual process itself, I can see this address lines up with that. So we know that nothing weird happened. Now, the thing is with both P invoke and D invoke, they come with a caveat, uh, at least uh, uh, for trying to bypass detections. And that is they don't bypass a hook. So what a hook is, is it's like a, a way that defensive software can interrupt the normal uh, flow of execution. So if I were to call a function, it could intercept it and then take it to an, another point in memory where it will then analyze that and see if what I'm passing in is malicious or if I'm going to be like doing anything malicious with that. It's what a lot of uh, antivirus and EDR softwares do. So I created this little hook based on a snippet from a guy named Nax Alpha. I modified it a bit because it wasn't working or maybe I'm stupid. But what it does is it's going to hook the message box A API. So rather than creating a message box, it's going to just print, you called a hooked message box. So if I continue execution here, uh, you, I can see it says you called hooked message box. And if we look at the test hook function, what, what I really just did was uh, I called uh, message box A dynamically. So while we can bypass the import address table signature, we'll, if there's a hook on the API that we're trying to call, the, we can still get caught. So manual mapping is another technique that dinvoke offers. It's kind of complicated, but to put it briefly, it's going to manually map a DLL fresh from disk into memory. It's going to you know, write each section of the PE, and then it's going to do all those relocations, figure out all the export forwarding. And then from there, we're going to dynamically execute functions from that uh, map DLL to avoid hooks. And the reason why this is going to avoid hooks is because AV and EDR, they usually write overwrite instructions from certain DLLs that are present when a process starts up, like in kernel 32 or NT DLL. But since we're mapping this DLL fresh from disk, it's not going to have any of those hooks. And there, But there are some edge cases where uh, manual mapping won't work uh, completely properly, which is why my example won't be using uh, message box this time. So my example is going to actually be a shellcode loader. Uh, it's going to use an enum display monitors API rather than a create thread call to execute the shellcode because uh, a lot uh, the, that create thread API call is used multiple times uh, by normal processes. So it's going to generate a lot of noise and I kind of want to just uh, be more specific with the hook that I'm showing. So uh, similar to our dynamic invoke code, uh, I'm setting up my hook again. The hook is going to uh, just print you called hooked enum display monitors. This stuff up here is just me setting up the hook, so that's not important. Th I'm pulling a shell code from another uh, VM that I have set up, and then I'm going to allocate it as read write executable using a dynamic call to virtual alloc. And I'm just going to copy it in. Now, within, uh, so once I set up the hook, I'm going to first call enum display monitors by Dan, uh, using dynamic API invoke. And this is going, uh, since I have the hook installed, this should be printing, you called hook enum display monitors. So if I run my executable, I can see it says you called hook enum display monitors. Now I'm going to do the mapping over here to actually do the manual mapping. You call the map mo uh, map module to memory, and then you specify the path to the DLL that it will be mapping to memory. Since uh, enum display monitors comes from user 32, I'll be mapping user 32. And it returns a PE manual map uh, structure. This is a custom de-invoke defined structure that basically contains certain metadata about the uh, DLL that's mapped into memory. To call, uh, to dynamically execute a API from our manually mapped DLL, we can use the call map DLL module export function. The first argument we're going to pass is that um, PE uh, info uh, member of that uh, PE manual map structure. The second argument we're going to pass in is the base of the PE that we mapped into memory, which is part of that data structure. 
The third argument is uh, a string that we're going to pass in that is going to be the API that we want to dynamically uh, execute from our map DLL. So it's going to go to the module base, parse the PE, and check all the exports and see uh, or it's going to look for this one. Pass in our delegate, so then we have a way to execute like the function pointer. Pass in our arguments, which I have set up up here. And then uh, over here, I'm saying false because call map DLL export will try to call the entry point. And sometimes that makes this thing kind of bork up, which it did in my case. So I'm going to specify this to false. And now that I'm, go I'm going to hit enter to resume the execution. And you can see our shell code, which uh, creates calc.exe is created. Uh, so we completely uh, bypassed the hook that I spun up. Now the the only uh, caveat to this is because we're mapping another uh, DLL into memory, if there's like a memory scanner that's looking through all our memory and it sees that there's a port, uh, since DLLs are under PEs or portable executables. So if it sees a PE is mapped into memory that isn't in the uh, module table within the, I believe the PEB or process environment block. We might get flagged for that, uh, but I'm not too sure how common that actually is. So dinvoke has another capability and that's going to be direct syscalls. This is done by the get syscall stub method over here, which essentially is going to read uh, NTDLL from disk since the NT APIs are going to be generally the syscall, uh, have the syscalls that we generally want. And then it's going to parse the exports and then map the NT API we want to call into memory so that we can uh, execute it via a delegate. So if I look into the function here, you could see it's going to get the NT DLL file path. And then it's going to allocate into memory and then it's going to write each section uh, by section, and then get the exports from it. And then it's going to after it writes uh, NTDLL into memory, it's going to find the syscall stub that we're going to want. And then it's going to write that in. And then it's going to free the entirety of NTDLL. So we don't have two NTDLLs in memory. It's going to leave a bit of a smaller trace. So all we have to do is just call get syscall stub and then specify the respective NT API of the syscall that we want to call. And then we're going to call it like we usually would. So in this case, you just set up your arguments in an object array, and then we're going to execute it via dynamic function invoke, uh, specify that the address is going to be the syscall stub, have our delegate, and then pass in our arguments. Now for this uh, little demonstration, I've set up a hook for NT allocate virtual memory. Uh, this hook, if I can pull it up over here, all it's going to do is it's going to check if the protection argument to NT allocate virtual memory is going to be OX420, and then it's going to make a little complaint and return a uh, unusual uh, status code. So to demonstrate the effectiveness of this, we're first going to call uh, NT allocate virtual memory via dynamic function invoke, and then we're going to call it via the syscall stub that we mapped. Syscall uh, just. As a reminder, the syscall stub mapping is done over here. Literally just call get syscall stub and then store the uh, return in a pointer. And then, yeah. So if I run this right now, we can see that the stub is mapped into this address. And then I'm going to continue execution. And then this first call, the dynamic function invoke, is passing in OX420 as the uh, protection argument and you can see the hook catches it. It says why do you pass 420? I'm returning code uh, 06969 and then printing the status code from the return. We can see that it says 06969 and the allocation is zero because uh, in th there was never an actual allocation made. It just printed and then returned. Now we're going to call uh, use dynamic function invoke on the stub that we mapped into memory. And we can see the NT status this time was zero and it actually got allocated to some memory. And if I take a peek at this in process hacker, we're going to go to manual map. 
of, I think it's this one. If we check out this address, we could see there's a bunch of blank memory because we just allocated, uh, let's see, 2048 uh, bytes, or at least 2048 bytes. Now, regarding the detection for this, though, to for what I'm aware of, because we're reading uh, NTDL from disk, we're going to essentially open up another handle to NTDLL. To my awareness, um, since NTDLL is loaded into processes at startup, uh, obtaining additional handle to NTDLL during runtime may look like suspicious activity for uh, defensive software. And the other thing is, if we actually take a look at this little stub over here, Come back over here. So this is gonna be our stub. We can see it follows the syscall format with uh, OX4C, 8B, D1. I don't know why this function actually maps two syscall stubs or, or three, uh, but that's aside from the point. Uh, actually, no, it's kind of a part of it because if there are memory scanners, uh, you know, scanning around and they see that there are, you know, syscalls mapped into memory in a completely blank page, it may look also suspicious in that regard. So Hell's Gate is a technique that was created by Smelly VX, the creator of VX Underground, and Eamon Sack, uh, essentially due to the standardized format of syscalls and their inclusion of the SSN within their code, it's possible for us to walk the exports of NTDLL, find the locations of each NPI from that, and then uh, read the syscall ID present within each of the NT API's code. So then we can sort of craft our own syscalls. And we could do this by both reading NTL, NTDLL from disk or the one loaded in memory. And what I mean by this is if we look at these are the NT APIs, the ZW is like the same thing basically, but if we notice they follow a pretty standardized format, move R 10 RCX, move R 10 RCX, move R 10 RCX, then into the EAX register is the ID, so 1819 1A, and then a little test thing is made here, and then the syscall instruction, then a return. So the format is pretty predictable for the most part, and each time it, the common pattern seems to be that aside from the RCX being moved to the R10, that the SSN is being moved into the EAX register. So if we could just read through NTDL in memory or from disk and just grab this number, we can sort of try to craft this little template. And in fact, there was a guy who did this. His name is uh, W. Benny, and he has a GitHub gist where we can see that for all x64 uh, Windows syscalls, they follow this format, move R10, RCX, EAX, syscall ID, syscall, and then return. Uh, and the reason why we want to sort of dynamically generate our own SSNs during runtime rather than hard code or static or statically code them in is because the SSNs will, con they've constantly changed throughout, uh, what do you call it? Uh, each Windows operating system version. So by being able to sort of figure it out during runtime, it makes our code a lot more flexible when we sort of deploy across different Windows versions. So the following code is uh, based on the Sharp Hell's Gate uh, project that Aminsec has done. But I made some modifications to it. So this is the original repo, but I made some modifications to it because from my usage, it only worked on .NET 5. Uh, I could be wrong, but that was just from my experience. And I personally like working with .NET Framework rather than .NET 5, particularly because of the smaller uh, compiled binary sizes. But anyways, so what this code does is we're going to start off by creating a system module uh, object. And what this does is it's just going to take the name of a DLL and then it's going to put in a file path and then from there, we're essentially just going to read it into memory and create a memory stream of it. After that, the load all structures function is called on this uh, instance of that uh, class. And this is just the standard PE parsing, very similar to what Dinvoke does, just with different function names. 
but essentially it gets the same result done. Now, this is a little different because what Amen Sec did uh, was he abused some of the funny stuff within the .NET internals that allows you to sort of uh, th there's essentially a read write executable section, multiple read write executable sections within a .NET process. And this is essentially going to be us determining the location of that. Uh, I have a mo module on this with more details later, but essentially we're going to locate a, a read write executable memory space so that we can write our syscall in there. And this is where uh, at least the Sharp Hells Gate project uh, differs significantly from the dinvoke get syscall stub is because dinvoke get syscall stub will map a syscall into memory but manually and to do this it will dynamically execute some nt apis so if you're trying to call nt allocate virtual memory as a syscall within dinvoke you're actually going to dynamically execute that <laughs> Uh, because it's one of the APIs it uses to allocate the, and write the syscalls into memory. But uh, moving forward, from there, we just do our standard setting up our arguments in an array, uh, and then getting the syscall ID. Uh, this is a function that, I mean, it, it's going to do what it says. It's going to get to the NT API that we pass in. So let's just say NT allocate virtual memory, and I'll just Okay, I'll, I'll use this as an example. It's not the same executable, but essentially it's going to get to this executable and move to the byte offset where this uh, 18th uh, or where this uh, SSN is located. So then we can just uh, stuff it into our syscall template, which is going to be down here and made during the direct syscall call. So then from there, after we grab our ID, we're going to call the direct syscall function where we can just uh, pass in our uh, the syscall ID returned by this function, the location to the read write executable space we generated. So then it can copy the syscall into that space. And then it's gonna we're going to pass in our arguments for it to make the call. So we can see over here, this is the little syscall stub that's made based off of uh, the GitHub gist I showed earlier. Then here the syscall ID is plugged into the template. Marshall.copy is called to copy this little stub into the read write executable space. And then we just use our little delegate for, uh, to execute it with the dynamic invoke uh, function that's built into delegates. So then just doing a little demo of this. You can see, all right, let me just full screen, make this a little wider. We can see that first the uh, the syscall number is shown from the function return 24, which is the eight, 18 in hex. And then from there we call our NT status for allocate, or we, we execute the function and get the NT status from it, which is zero, which means it's su successful. And then we're showing the changed uh, base address argument from the NT allocate call, which is now this. So we know our thing works successfully. And while this technique seems very effective, which it, it is, it's, it's a very uh, cool and powerful technique, there are still some drawbacks. And the first part is because the way that uh, Hell's Gate is looking for the uh, sys call numbers. If there are some instructions inserted or alterations made to this uh, relatively uh, standardized uh, syscall template, then it might not be able to determine the syscall number correctly, which means we won't be able to generate our dynamic syscalls properly. And then uh, additionally, this is just something that's inherent to this the overarching technique, which is called direct syscall. So this applies to both the invokes get syscall stub and this sharp hell's gate technique. And the drawback is syscalls, uh, they make uh, the entry to the kernel mode from the user land. So eventually the kernel has to return the execution to the user land. 
And where it's going to return to is where the syscall instruction is made. And since the syscall instruction is normally made in NTDLL, uh, the kernel is usually going to return to NTDLL after a syscall is made. Some detection software have picked up on this. So if a syscall returns to an address that's not within the NTDLL range, that's going to, uh, the NTDLL memory range, that's going to start raising some uh, alarms essentially because the trend with the way we are using our direct syscalls is that we're just mapping our syscalls into somewhat arbitrary memory. In the case of dnvokes get syscall stub, it is a manually mapped somewhere in memory. And in the case of this sharp pulse gate, it's within the read write executable space of a predetermined .NET uh, memory section. And neither of these are within NTDLL. So we could potentially get flagged there. And these concerns are gonna be addressed within the next module. So indirect syscalls adjust the kernel to user land returned by a simple trick. And that is after adjusting the registers, uh, it's going to jump to the location of and a syscall address within memory rather than ec directly executing the syscall itself. So when the kernel returns to the user land, it's going to return to the memory region within NTDLL or whatever else DLL makes syscall uh, calls rather than a random uh, random like memory address outside of that, which looks much more suspicious. And the little assembly over here is going to look like this. So move our 10 RCX. This is just adjusting our registers for the syscall instruction. And then we're going to move the uh, the address of the syscall instruction into the R11 register. And we're just going to jump to it. And if you notice, this looks very similar to the Hell's Gate code or direct syscall method, where it's just move our 10 RCX, just moving the registers. But instead of jumping, it just does a normal syscall instruction. And this makes the kernel return to wherever this method is located in memory, which probably isn't in a DLL. So it's going to look a little more suspicious. And to demonstrate the detection for these direct syscalls, we're going to, or I'm going to be using a DLL made by this guy called Winternal, who made a way to essentially detect the direct syscalls that we make. So going into our dnvo code, I just I'm just loading it into memory, and or I'm just loading the DLL into the process, force a habit, and then if I call this thing, we can see it's doing its little debug output, and our stub is mapped. This is just the managed hook that I wrote for catching a dynamic invocation, so we can ignore this. And when the direct syscall is made, uh, in this case, through using the, the syscall that we essentially manually mapped in, uh, the kernel is going to return to that manually mapped spot, and it's going to cry about it. The Hell's Gate code is basically the same thing. We're going to be running load library with p invoke, since there's no uh, wait else for me to load it in because the invoke already had some code for me and doing that you can see debug output and it immediately just explodes on me yeah so uh unlucky but going to the indirect syscalls for that i made in this program oh let's see I don't know why it sometimes bugs out like that, but there we go. I, I honestly have no why uh, it bugs out like this, but if I don't load the library, it works much more consistently. So, I mean, there's that, I guess, but yeah, the memory, the syscall is made successfully. I can view the memory that it allocated and I actually wrote a letter A in there. So yeah indirect syscalls are pretty cool and the way my code actually works is i already showed the whole it, it works like 99 percent uh the same as sharp hell's gate where it has a syscall stub that 
we're going to sort of write into a memory so here's us generating our stub here's the read write execute memory segment that we're generating which i will go into the specifics in a later video and then we're just going to use a delegate to execute this you know stub that we're creating and that's just going to be the index is called invoke passing in the delegate passing in our arguments into x is call invoke generates the stub copies that stub into our generated read write execute memory and then it's going to use a delegate to execute it now i did address another issue in the last video i believe where i was saying how the way hell's gate uh finds the syscall ids is a bit uh flawed or at least like there's a potential it could not work so the solution to that was this guy named elephant seal and he basically made a little observation that you can actually extract the syscall ids by looking at the nt or zw functions or order in memory and associating that order with their id so in this case zw access check is the first zw or at, they're like the same thing as the nt apis and the user line at least and it's the first uh like whatever api I was saying and you could see the id is one if we go to the next one it, or this id is zero this is id one two three four their id is associated with their order in memory from uh, lowest address to highest address so what my code also does to grab the ids is rather than looking into the nt apis and finding the a specific offset it's going to look for all things in this case i was looking for nt apis rather than zw but you know you could do either or and then i'm just sorting through all of uh, all of them and doing a really weird uh sort that chat gpt kind of showed me but yeah to to get the uh all these apis i just used the invoke uh code that allowed me to parse all the exports uh of the nt dll and then yeah combining all this code together we have a, a fairly simple looking indirect syscall uh mechanism that is relatively easy to extend since i mean just like everything else we've been doing throughout this whole course you just make an object array of your args and then use a function that passes in the delegate and the args and in this case the name of the api so it can look through this little sorted uh, information that I had earlier. And yeah. So C Sharp compiles to a language called MSIL or Microsoft Intermediary Language, which then will compile to machine code during runtime when needed. And that whole process is called JIT compilation or just in time compilation because it's literally just in time. Uh, take this nothing method, for example. It'll compile to MSIL, but when I call it, the CLR is going to uh, JIT compile it into machine code literally right on time. And then for the rest of the runtime of this program, this thing will be in uh, machine code. So it won't need to constantly compile it for every time I call it. Based on my reading by this uh, beautiful blog post by Xpian, it's pretty, it's amazing. And that uh, Sharpel's gate code from a few modules ago, uh, it's actually possible to abuse this JIT compilation a bit. At a high level, the machine code of a JIT method actually lies within read write executable memory, which is just like a byproduct of the whole way the CLR, uh, .NET, whatever. It's just a byproduct of how it actually works. We don't actually need to allocate this suspicious uh, memory or anything. And there is a way for us to accurately identify its location. So we can actually stuff small things like our indirect or direct syscall stubs in there, which are only like 13 bytes in size or so. So as I was saying earlier, typically a method is only JIT compiled when it's uh, first called with uh, in the program. But you can actually force a JIT uh, compilation by using this runtime per, uh, helpers pair method. And you call this on a method handle from a method information object which could be uh, obtained like this so in this case i have a uh, static and public method called nothing and i can obtain the method information of it like this 
it lies within the program class and then I can grab its handle and then JIT compile it like this. So, uh, I'm not actually calling nothing anytime before this. So if, as a demo, let's see if I could spin this up. Pull out one debug this time. And I'm just going to uh, run my code. And do a little breakpoint. So right now, uh, nothing, even though it's not called at, uh, until here and we're right here, nothing should be JIT compiled, whereas print, uh, print's also not called and it's another method that I have. And since it's not called, nor forcibly JIT compiled, it, it shouldn't be JIT compiled at all. So if I just uh, load the, uh, the sauce DLL that's going to allow me to do some better debugging. And then I'm going to dump it to, I'm going to dump the method table. And this is just uh, some structure that contains uh, the information about the methods, uh, credit to experience blog post. We can see that the nothing method is JIT compiled because I called runtime helpers prepare method, even though I didn't actually call nothing, at least not yet because we're right here right now on line 33 and it's not called until line 47 and print uh, I mean it's, it's not J compiled it's it's like nothing right now because I haven't called it yet and I haven't uh, forcibly compiled it either uh, once we actually J compile it though so let's take nothing for example if I uh, disassemble its uh, method table entry, I can see it's actually going to call this, it's going to do a call to pre code fix up thunk from the CLR.dll. And what this is going to do is this actually does digit compiling. So this is why when we first call the method, it actually is going to call this, which will JIT compile us. Whereas for nothing method I already JIT compiled it so if we actually disassemble that we can see it doesn't do that whole prefix of thunk it actually well I mean this machine code ends up like doing nothing there's some weird dot net uh, debug method thing that seems to just be around but for the most part uh, this thing actually does nothing because the actual code is supposed to just do nothing now when I continue execution, I'm going to basically do what I did with uh, my indirect syscall uh, code and also what sharp hellscape did. And what it's going to do is we're going to get the pointer to the print function. In this case, it's this non JIT compiled method right here. And we're going to get a pointer to that uh, function code and we're going to make a byte array this byte array is actually assembly for the whole, uh, very similar to my indirect syscall stuff. It's just going to move the pointer to print into the R11 register and jump there. And from there, I'm going to call nothing. Uh, oh, uh, that byte array is going to be copied into where uh, not the location of nothing's machine code is. Uh, so one more time. Just gonna get the just gonna set up this assembly where we're going to move the location of the pre-jitted print function into R11, and we're gonna jump to R11, and that uh, assembly code essentially is going to be copied into the nothing function. Now nothing is supposed to do nothing, but after we do all that, if I continue execution, we can see it called uh, high from print is called or printed. And this is from the print function. And it's actually printing twice because I call both the nothing method and I'm actually executing the uh, function at where nothing is. So this is literally doing the same thing. Uh, it's just, th this is how I do it within uh, indirect syscall, whatever. But basically, uh, we replace the code, the machine code within the uh, nothing function so if I actually look at it now so before this if we go back up here 
we can see it was like push RBP sub RSP 20 H blah, blah, blah. But I look now and it's, it's patched with the whole move R11 to in this case, the location of our print function at least or its method table entry, right? So move our 11 there, then it's going to jump to our 11. So we're going to jump to this, the, at the, at first it was pre jitted And then when we jump to the pre jitted function, it did call pre code fix up, blah, 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 which actually JIT compiled it. So if we look at it now, we can see that it is, uh, let's see, going to actually jump now. It's going to jump to this location once I check compiled it. So I unassemble that. And here is my uh, actual compiled machine code. So we can see it's, it's a bit uh, winded, but uh, one more time, we sort of patch the nothing function so that it's going to jump to the print function the f on the first time it j it jumped there it got jit compiled and then ran uh or then printed that and now the code looks like this and we can get high from print despite calling uh nothing which is supposed to do nothing and the whole way this ties into indirect syscalls is i have a sacrificial method in this case something like nothing and I just get my syscall stub instead of another function and I just patch that uh, sacrificial function and then execute it via a delicate 